Good afternoon. I'm Margot Rayner from the Charter Banker Institute. Thank you for joining us today for our Vulnerable, vulnerable Customers webinar with Graham Bantz. Graham has had an extensive career in law enforcement and banking. Over the years, he has gained a very deep knowledge of organised crime. This has equipped him with the ability to work with a wide array of partners in both public and private sectors to devise prevention tactics and techniques which restrict and reduce the viability of criminal enterprises. Graham's passion and belief is that if genuine people and organisations can work together, people, communities and businesses will be safer and risks associated with criminality will constantly rise. If you have any questions for Graham throughout the session, please use the online function and he will aim to answer as many he, as he can prior to close today. Without further ado, I'm delighted to hand over to Graham. Thanks very much, Margot, uh, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm really, really pleased to, to be doing this presentation to the Chartered Institute. Um, this, is, this is not a, a, an academic or theoretical lecture. Uh, it, it is simply a, a presentation uh, which is designed to, I suppose, pr provoke some thought in your own heads about the position of the financial services sector, how it engages with its customers, and in fact how it engages with other uh, public sector and private sector organisations to um, protect the most vulnerable people in our communities. Um, if you go back to uh, last year, February, in two th February 2015, the Financial Conduct Authority produced a, a, a paper called Occasional Paper uh, Number 8, where they spoke about uh, banking products and the lack of products that were out there, financial services products that were out there uh, that catered for people either with mental disability, physical disability or other kinds of vulnerability uh, and, and they, were, they were simply prompting some thought on the part of the banking sector to think about the kind of products that were available. And actually the document sp speaks about, it's a 118-page document, um, but it talks throughout the, the document about the perfect customer. So it talks about banking products being geared towards the perfect customer. So that's the customer who has full faculties, full uh, functionality, and can manage their own fan financial affairs, which gave prompt to, to today's uh, entitled uh, called the imperfect customer, because I thought that would be quite... Um, I thought it would explain it better in, in terms of where I'm coming from. So, in terms of some of the authorities that, that uh, you know, some of the resources that, that you might like to have a look at, uh, there's obviously the occasional paper uh, from February 2015 from the FCA, which I've referred to. FCA then produced another uh, paper this year uh, called Aging Population and Financial Services, and it talks about the elderly uh, population and their relationship with money and how they how they interact with with uh, banks and, and other financial services organizations um, the information commissioner in Scotland uh, at a conference um, you know that's a quote from him uh, think about what financial harm may result from not sharing information uh, and that's simply up there because I strongly believe that data protection is very often used as an excuse for inactivity um, data protection does not um, preclude us from sharing uh, nearly as much information as a lot of people would like to imagine. Um, I think the Scottish Government's Serious Organised Crime Strategy talks about reducing the harm caused by serious and organised crime, and that is, that is a collective um, between public and private sector organisations. And one, one other document that, that should be in there that's not, uh, and, and is my omission, is the the BBA's uh, document published this year called Improving Outcomes for Customers in Vulnerable Circumstances, where they set out, um, I think it's nine principles um, that uh, BBA members, member organisations uh, should be adopting, um, not dissimilar to, to some of the work that's been going on in Scotland. And, and I have to say from the outset that an awful lot of what I'm talking about today is um, a combination of what's happening in Scotland and what's happening across the UK, uh, simply because uh, I led the Scottish Government's project on financial harm for a year and a half, uh, and we reported to the Scottish Government ministers there's quite a lot of activity ongoing, but 
but but that doesn't mean to say that it's not a UK wide issue and that some of the solutions are not UK uh, centric. So I thought it might be useful just to let you see some of the statistics. Some of you will see have seen uh, some of this, uh, this some of these numbers, but that kind of tells us um, what our population is like at the moment and what it's going to be like in the next 20 years. So, you know, people aged over 75 years in Scotland will have increased by 82% in the next 20 years. Um, if I go down to, um, you know, not enough money for a £300 bill, half of all UK adults, that's currently as we, as we exist at the moment. Living with dementia at the moment, just, you know, 200,000 short of a million. Uh, and people suffering from a mental disorder in any one year. Uh, one in four, one, one in four UK adults. So th there's some interesting numbers in there, uh, and I would suggest to you that that's not just a reflection of society as it is today and how it's going to be in 20 years' time. That's the bank's customer base. That is the business customer base in 20 years' time. And I think now is the time to be looking at what the products look like that are going to serve these customers in 20 years' time appropriately. Um, and, and one thing that we found, you know, the bit at the bottom there, one thing we did find during the project was that there are no hard and fast numbers in terms of financial harm. Um, however, anecdotally, and through some of the research we did, uh, we established, and, and this, is, this is a fairly widely accepted number, that 25% of financial harm uh, relates to scams and bogus workmen and internet uh, crime. Uh, but 75% is friends, relatives and carers, which is quite a scary thought. Now, there's an awful lot of focus put on the 25% because, it, frankly, in my view, that's probably the easier bit to, to focus on, uh, where the criminal element are, 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 are attacking and focusing on vulnerable people. The 75% is a much more difficult and very sensitive area uh, to, to be tackling. Um, so that's, that's kind of where we're at in terms of society. So in terms of intervention, um, you know, I'm talking to financial services today or, or, or you know, related organisations. Um, and I would suggest to you that this is not a case of saying to you that the banks are the be-all and end-all. Uh, the banks have a part to play. And I thought it would be useful just to put up a list of some of the stakeholders who are responsible, who have a, a, a duty of care towards the vulnerable people in our communities. Uh, and you'll see the banker up in the top left corner, the police officer, the health worker, the social worker. Um, then you've got the solicitor, um, and you've got the friend, the neighbour, the family member, an ethical business, and, and by that I mean uh, genuine businesses who operate in an ethical way. And, and, and obviously carers. The reason I put ethical business up there, it's an interesting one. Um, to give you an example, uh, a bathroom company, a genuine, genuine bathroom company, a uh, salesman goes to the door of an elderly lady in, uh, in Glasgow, and she's getting her bathroom measured up, and he goes in, does it, and he quotes her £4,000 to do the job. Um, if you sign up today and you give me a £2,000 deposit, I'll keep it at that price. Uh, the elderly lady says, well, I don't have £2,000 on me. It's all right. I'll take you to the bank to get your £2,000, which she does. She, do, she goes to the bank. She gets the £2,000. She hands it over to the salesman. Now, she eventually gets her bathroom fitted. She gets everything done okay. So I would suggest to you that that is... Uh, a partly ethical business. I think, I think they're ethical in the sense that they did the job properly. I would suggest that their tactics in, in gathering the 50% deposit were unethical. And my difficulty with that is if you have ethical businesses acting in an unethical way, it confuses the public and makes it more difficult for them to identify the good from the bad. So I think there is a huge emphasis, or there needs to be a huge emphasis, on um, creating clear blue water between the guys who are bad and the guys who are good. Um, and, and obviously, uh, you know, the bank came into that situation because, you know, the transaction was, was, was made at a, a branch of a bank. I'm not blaming the bank in this case. All I'm saying is 
that there was a combination of ethical business, banker, customer, which caused this salesman to get his two grand. Now, that could have been a that could have been an unethical business that wasn't going to turn up and do the job just as easily it was an ethical business. That's why ethical business is in there. But it's a fair number, and that's that's only a smattering of stakeholders uh, whose whose job it is, in my view, to intervene and prevent financial harm uh, happening. So let's look about vulnerability, and and, and and this is an interesting one in the sense that. Um, you know, day and daily I, I hear debates about what, so what is what, what is the definition of vulnerable? What does it actually mean? Um, so, so let's call it, you know, the imperfect customer. What, what causes a customer to be imperfect? And here's some of the, here are some of the reasons uh, that somebody would be uh, vulnerable or an imperfect customer. So loneliness and isolation is, is regarded as one being one of the the largest causes or the greatest causes of financial harm because actually some people latch on to the abuser and treat the abuser as their friend because it's the only person in the world that they know um, and, and actually become uh, totally convinced that this person is taking their money from them uh, for their own good. Uh, cognitive decline, that's, that's you know dementia, that's old age, it's, it, it's, it's Alzheimer's, it's all of these conditions that people uh, suffer from and it's not just in older in, 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 in later years uh, are full of increasing numbers of people are suffering from dementia at much earlier uh, uh, <coughs> younger ages physical disability um, these are people who cannot you know they've got physical debility uh, disability can't leave the house um, and are dependent on other people to get their cash for them if, if cash is what they need. Uh, and one of the difficulties I've got is that the care uh, sector ha clearly have a, guide uh, a guideline that says you will not um, take the PIN number of a debit card from anybody uh, to go and get cash out of a machine for them. The banks equally have the rule that you don't pass on your PIN number. But if this physically disabled person who can't get out of the house wants some cash to give the grandchildren when they turn up, on a Wednesday afternoon or a Thursday evening or whatever, how do they get their cash? How do they get some of that cash if, if there is nobody to go to the bank for them? Um, I'll, I'll leave that to you guys and we can maybe debate that later on, but physical disability um, is a clear cause of financial harm when, when PIN numbers are, are handed over. Critical life events, um, you know, we have deaths and marriages and various other um, things that happen in life that, that can make us vulnerable, and, and I won't go through all of that. Unusually large deposits, disposable cash. By that I mean redundancy, by that I mean pension and, uh, 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 maturity, um, you know, uh, insurance maturity, all of these things uh, where normal, uh, you know, people who have full capacity in, 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 you know, in the normal course of events, suddenly they have an amount of money uh, deposited into their account. They become that, the, the existence of that money in their account makes them vulnerable. Because actually the impact, if you've got, say, for example, £200,000 deposited from a redundancy or a pension uh, sitting in your account, somebody comes along, rips you off, or steals money from you, say 50000 the impact of that... Um, is not the same because you've got 150,000 left. The impact of that is not the same as it would be if you ha if you'd only had 50,000 pounds in your account at the start. So you've lost a lot. You're back. You're down to a zero balance. Um, so people become um, a little more um, open to uh, financial harm if they have large amounts of de you know cash deposited in an account that they're not used to having. Actions of others, friends, relatives, carers, I, I spoke about that earlier on. Uh, this is about convincing vulnerable people that it's for their own good that they pass on the PIN number or they hand over money um, or they uh, you know, allow somebody to be signed on to the bank account. And, and it's, it's, it's psychological warfare, quite frankly, uh, with, with vulnerable people. Um, and then actions of others, which is, you know, your, your doorstep salesman, that's the scams, that's 25% uh, that I spoke about. But 
This definition of what vulnerability is, I, I think we should stop my own personal view, and this is a personal view, we should stop talking about the definitions and we should start talking about two categories. I think there is acute vulnerability and I think there's occasional vulnerability. So acute vulnerability is that type of vulnerability that's caused by mental or physical um, incapacity. And I think occasional vulnerability is that occasion where money is deposited in an account or there is a critical life event which is temporary. It's a temporary vulnerability um, that's, that, that you know, has a beginning and has an end, whereas acute vulnerability is that, is that um, ongoing vulnerability that, that people have. So I threw up four questions for uh, you folk on the, on the call, and you can think about this as I go through the rest of the presentation. So how can a bank be expected to know about those occasional or acute vulnerabilities? How can, how can they find out about them? Who can tell them? Uh, who can help a bank to help its imperfect customers? Because clearly, um, a bank is a bank. A bank has a function. Uh, but a bank is also a, can also be a stakeholder um, in preventing or protecting vulnerable people. Um, top right, what gets in the way of helping imperfect customers? And I'd be interested in some of your views on that. And do you as a bank really know who your imperfect customers are? In other words, do you know who has vulnerabilities or do you not? Because as far as I'm aware, when I open a bank account, nobody says to me, do you have vulnerabilities? Vulnerabilities develop during the lifetime of a bank account rather than pre-existing uh, the opening of it. So I'd be interested in, in, in what your thoughts are uh, through that. And a couple of questions to pose um, in terms of your own organisations, and that's, this is not something I want you to shout out about. It's, 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 a, it's a thought process in your own, your own mind that I would love you to consider. And that is, is your bank, the way you perceive your own bank, uh, part of the financial harm problem uh, in that it's not managing vulnerable customers particularly well, or is it an integral element of the overall solution? And if you're part of the solution, how does that actually play out? Now, I can tell you that my view of banking um, in the UK is that it has come um, an enormous way in the last two to three years in terms of the way that it supports and helps vulnerable customers. In fact, it's probably progressed uh, at a faster rate of knots in terms of looking after people than any of the public sector agencies. Um, part of the job I do is trying to work between public and private sector to bring them closer together collaboratively on a local basis to make sure that people are protected in the best possible way. And I'm not going to name brands, I'm not going to name uh, names today, uh, but I can I can name two or three financial services organisations that are absolutely out there in front um, and are actually putting Scotland and the rest of the UK well ahead of any other uh, country in Europe, and that's coming from the regulators uh, in terms of looking after customers. So lest you think this is a criticism of banks, it is certainly not. Um, I have a previous history of falling out with people to protect uh, and, and stick up for the banks uh, in terms of what they're doing. Uh, because I, I, I've yet to come across a retail banker, or in fact a personal banker, that doesn't want to do the right thing by their own customer. But they are, they are stopped from doing it. If I go back to the previous slide, um, you know, top right, what gets in the way of us helping our vulnerable customers? Um, I, think, I think I'd be interested in your views on that. So, intervention opportunities. I, I just thought I would throw this slide in just to give you um, an indication of, you know, where the opportunity, or give you a, 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 an opportunity to think for yourself in terms of where your intervention opportunities would come. Uh, in terms of the, you know, the first box there, bogus workmen, scam mail, internet scams, carers, relatives, friends. Uh, so. At what point would a financial services organisation be able to intervene and maybe stop financial harm happening or continuing? Um, and we, you know, we've got all these public information campaigns going on, uh, and in fact there is another one 
being uh, launched next month, I'm saying next month in September, um, by the City of London Police and uh, the DCPCU and Financial Fraud Action, uh, which will be a very interesting campaign that's going to run for a year. So watch this space in terms of that. You'll probably start seeing posters all over the place and, and television and radio interviews to try and change people's habits, to try and change people's behaviours in relation to um, not trusting everything before them. So what's monitored at the bank? Um, how is it monitored and why? So it's unusual transactions, it's large debits, sudden changes, secrecy, uh, information provided by concerned people. In other words, somebody coming into the bank and telling you, I think uh, there's something not right here. And I think all of this is changing, and, and we need to be cognizant of the fact that branches are closing, and that more and more transactions are happening online. So how do the, do the processes within the bank? There are two elements to banking, as, as far as I can see, in terms of this prevention aspect. It's what, what is it that the electronic processes are going to pick up, and how are the, how are the processes programmed? Um, but for the customer-facing uh, parts of banking, um, you know, what's the attitude of the teller, uh, what's the knowledge of the teller, and what is, what is the readiness of the teller to, to, um, to alert the, the uh, other people that there is, there is a problem. So, so these questions that are put in the right-hand <coughs> the right hand box there are questions that I would suggest that every um, bank teller uh, should, and, and, and in fact uh, call centre operators should be thinking uh, about asking, do I know my customer, do I know who I'm speaking to, what am I being asked to do, does it actually feel right, because you know 90% of this is gut reaction uh, in terms of identification of, of financial harm, what do I need to ask the customer to make it feel right or make it feel wrong. Um, how, do, how will I explain the delay while the checking is done? Now, this is an interesting one in the sense that, you know, with the, with the banks constantly hammering staff about customer care, customer care, customer care, an awful lot of people think that customer care is about transacting things very quickly. I would suggest to you that customer care can also include building in delays so that the bank can check and make sure that what is going on is, is pucker and is actually genuine uh, because there, there have been experiences uh, in the last couple of years of uh, retail banks who have refused point blank to carry out transactions because they, they know it's a fraud, they know it's a scam and in fact on one occasion I heard of the customer actually took the bank to the full complaints process because the bank just flat down refused to send the money uh, to, to where it was being asked to send it to, and, and, and you know the bank the bank was was uh, exonerated in terms of any uh, any blame, um, but that was a case of looking after a customer to the best of their ability by not giving them money, which is kind of conver uh, it's, it's the converse of what of, of, of what we we would normally think, and then what do I do now, you know what's the what's the next step. After I've asked all those questions, and I'm still not happy. So, um, key elements of how I believe, and how a number of us believe, that banks and their staff uh, can be part of the solution. I'm not going to go through everything in, in a lot of detail, but I, there's, there, there is one item there that I would like to uh, focus on, and that is the fourth bullet point down, uh, which reads engaging with local communities and partners. This is absolutely key to understanding the roles of partners, gaining vital local intelligence, and influencing local agendas. I very strongly believe um, that joint training, joint awareness locally uh, with trading standards, police, social services, uh, banks, legal firms, uh, you know, building industry is key to that creating that collaborative approach to uh, protecting the vulnerable people in our communities. I, I suspect that if, if that lot that I, I mentioned there got together very effectively locally in every area, um, we would then make the United Kingdom a very, very hostile place for criminals uh, to try and rip people off. Um, 
Knowing where to report concerns is a really interesting one, and I'll, I'll, I've got a case study that I'm just going to read to you in a couple of minutes that will, it will pinpoint exactly where that comes in, uh, knowing where to report concerns. Because very often the police are the point of last resort, and actually by the time or at the point at which the bank is identifying potential financial harm, there isn't evidence of a specific crime. Um, it, it may be something that's leading to a crime uh, that other organisations such as social services or the public guardian may have an interest in. So, so there's, there's a real key element in terms of where to report concerns. And acting when it doesn't feel right. You know, I go back to that, that, that gut reaction, that, that intuition uh, that I spoke about. So what do we... What do we uh, what do we talk about in terms of victims, banks, and bankers? So the victim is, is, is exposed to the risk of bogus workmen, scam mail, internet carers, internet uh, fraud, carers, relatives, and friends. And when I talk about internet fraud, I talk about your Chinese dating agencies, your uh, Australian lotteries, French lotteries, your um, you know investment scams, and, and so on and so forth. Um, where does it play out at the bank? Well, it plays out at the bank in terms of unusual transactions. So that's that, it, that's that monitoring of, of norm, normality and, and being in a position to identify when, it, when it's not normal. Uh, large debits. Uh, now, some of your anti-money laundering processes will pick up on large de debits, uh, however, not all of them. Um, Sudden changes, uh, like changes in signatories, so we've got experience of you know powers of attorney sitting in a uh, over, powers of attorney over money that's sitting in a branch, and then suddenly a, a new signatory comes on, and this is the this is the other member of the family who's who's into the ripoffs. Uh, secrecy, you know, brother saying don't tell anybody about, don't tell my sister about the fact that I'm withdrawing this information, uh, and so on and so forth. And, and getting information from a variety of sources. So it might be a social worker, it might be a training standards officer, it might be a police officer about one of your account holders uh, and what, what you actually do with that. Uh, one of the complaints I've got constantly is uh, that public sector agencies are constantly battering banks about not sharing information. Um, well, I've kind of turned that in its head and said to, or asked the question of social services et al. So tell me the last time you walked into the uh, banking hall of a branch, spoke to the manager and told them about one of the bank's customers that you were looking after. And of course, I get this oh, confidentiality argument and all the rest of it, which is exactly what they've been accusing the banks of doing. Um, we need to get rid of all that nonsense because because actually if if, if our if a social worker is putting a care plan in place for an individual and that individual knows where the bank account is held, I see no reason why and the social worker can't come into the bank. They don't need to tell you the full detailed medical history, not as if you'd be interested anyway, but they need to tell the bank manager, this is a vulnerable person, we've got a care plan in place, could you put some sort of monitoring on the account? I don't see anything wrong with that. The Information Commissioner doesn't see anything wrong with that. Um, it, it is simply a, a state of mind, I think, on the part of the public sector. Number one, they're going back to 2007, 2008. I don't trust the bank. Uh, some of them have never quite got over that yet. Um, but the other part of it is they've got this misguided interpretation of what data protection tells them they can and cannot do, uh, and we need to get over that. And the way they think we go over that is through, is through local training and local awareness. Uh, about all of this, uh, all of these issues, um, and of course, as I said before, the banker: Do I know my customer? What am I being asked to do? Does it feel right? Uh, and I think we know that. But I think the overall, the overriding message is: mes uh, you know, if in doubt, uh, escalate it. I'm going to pose you. A, in fact, can I can I just stop here and ask uh, Margot? Are, are there any burning questions anybody wants to ask me? Um, I've got one question that's come through, okay. which I think is a two-parter. So okay. um, they've asked, what responsibility should a financial institution have to corroborate a customer's current state of vulnerability before executing any specific transaction 
or before allowing a recurring transaction, a monthly withdrawal plan, etc., to yep. continue. Yep. So I think that arises from what I spoke about earlier on, that, that local um, collaboration with the public sector agencies that are able to better inform you about the state of mind of one of your customers. Uh, the last thing we want to do here is say to a bank teller or a bank manager, anybody that works in a bank, you know, you're an expert in vulnerability. That's the last thing that people should expect of a bank. Um, what, what, um, what should be happening, in my view, locally, is that there should be an ability of the bank to contact the social services or the health professional or the policeman or the police officer, rather, or the, the trading standards officer or even the public guardian um, to quote the name of the person and say, listen, is there a vulnerability here that we need to keep an eye on as a bank? Because we're as, we're as much part of this um, as you are. So we have a responsibility, we have a duty of care for this customer. And I think you are, <coughs> you as a banker discharging that duty of care at the point at which you are asking the question of public sector agencies locally about the customer. Can, can, does that kind of answer the question? I think so, yes. Thanks, Graham. And then just the second part of that was, um, aside from a telephone or face-to-face -face meeting, how can the financial institution demonstrate they have evaluated the potential for vulnerability and what training or of customer-facing staff would this require to be considered to be more effective? So I've been involved in a number of uh, internal uh, training sessions with, <coughs> with quite a few banks uh, over the last two years. Um, I go back again to what I said. I, I genuinely believe it's all very well to train internally, to, to do the... I mean, I used to work for RBS and we had a, the process regular reading and viewing because it, it, was a, it was a regulatory requirement of all members of the bank and, and, and you know, that's still in place. That is one way of cascading a message. I don't think it's the most effective way. I think the most effective way, and, and it would be done in different ways in different areas, but the most effective way of training people, uh, raising people's awareness, and also understanding the functions of other organisations is to get people together locally. So you're of the banks locally in a local authority area, you're of social services, you're of police. Uh, in fact, I'm actually working with Borders Council and Redfisher Council. I had a meeting with this morning uh, and a number of other councils in Scotland um, with that very aim in mind uh, to bring uh, financial services, and it's not just about banks, you know, it's credit unions, it's building societies, it's legal firms, um, it's everybody that has a stakeholding. You know, remember that the, the, the slide I showed you earlier on with all of those different people and the stakeholders for intervention? Um, I think all of them need to be part of, of, of the learning process locally. So, so what it does is it allows good, solid processes to develop, it creates network, local networks, which, you know, national networks are all very well, but local networks are the ones that work. Um, and it creates uh, an understanding of each other's functions and each other's risk appetites and each other's willingness and, I suppose, restrictions. Because let's not forget there are restrictions on, on what you can and cannot, uh, what a bank can, can and cannot share. Um, but I would suggest to you that um, a teller having concern about, you know, being concerned about the welfare of a customer is actually not a data protection issue at all. It is simply a member of the public being concerned and reporting it to the authorities. Any, any requests and sharing of information about financial data comes at a later stage under, under the correct warranty. But the bottom line is, I think, it's a kind of long way of explaining, I think, local training uh, and local liaison, local, local collaboration is by far and away better than individual internal training. Great, thank you, Graham. Um, and then we just have a comment from a listener just participating yep. in the discussion who says, it's so difficult to know the vulnerabilities of a customer, yep. especially if these vulnerabilities arise throughout the duration of the banking relationship. Sure. Customers who experience a cognitive decline and a lack of understanding of phishing techniques are at an enhanced risk of falling victim to this type of fraud. Yep. I believe the FI can be an integral part in solving the issue based on analytics, monitoring account activity and making calls. Absolutely. It's really just an extension of KYC. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. I've got, I've got nothing to add to that. 
frankly, I think I, I, I agree entirely uh, with that. And I think, you know, the one point I would make is that we need to be thinking about that now because there is a decline in face-to-face -face transactions. There is an increase in, in, in online transactions, and I think we need to get really, really smart uh, with with the the monitoring and the identification of, of unusual transactions. Absolutely. Great. Well, that's all I've got okay. from the questions at this point. Right. So I'm going to ask some questions. Not that I'm expecting answers, but uh, I'm going to ask some questions um, about your view of your own bank or your own organisation, your own financial services organisation. And I'm asking uh, six questions. I, I don't expect you to write in to me and give me the answers. All I'm, expe all I'm expecting you to do is, is, is actually think about uh, those questions. So, uh, would your bank commit to working collaboratively with other financial services organisations, public and third sectors, to minimise the risk posed to adults who are at risk of financial harm? In other words, joint training. Do you think your organisation uh, would commit to doing that in all of the areas within which your organisation is represented. The second question, uh, would you as a, a bank, as an organisation, participate in initiatives to raise public awareness of financial harm? Um, so if, if, to pluck one out of there, if Glasgow City Council uh, was having a, a public awareness uh, campaign uh, next month, I don't, they're not, but, but if they were, uh, would the branches of your bank in Glasgow participate in that public awareness campaign? And bear in mind, the guy that's talking to you today attempted uh, on a number of occasions to put posters up in branches, etc., years and years ago and was told, uh, no, you're not doing that because it doesn't have uh, the logo on it or because it doesn't fit the corporate image of the branch. Are we still in that mindset, or have we changed? Uh, would you as an organisation embark on a process of raising awareness of financial harm within your own organisation? Um, I can I'd probably answer that for quite a few of you, and, and, and because I've been involved in the internal uh, raising of awareness, and, and it's been hugely successful, I have to say. Um, I, I just I, I just find um, frontline staff in banks to be very very receptive to this stuff and, and very enthusiastic about looking after customers. Um, I, th I think they have they, they, over the years they have suffered through you know negative media and all the rest of it, but boy do they keep their heads up and just keep plowing on. And, and I think it's a fantastic uh, sector for looking after people at that at that level. Um, do you have in place a process to identify when a customer may be at risk of financial harm? That's maybe a harder one to uh, to answer. And that's a process not just at the front line, but a process electronically. So I had, the, I had a debate with a bank uh, not that long ago about, um, so you expect the teller to know all about this customer. We're telling the, you know, KYC, you know, know your customer. But actually, the teller is not necessarily aware of checks that have been getting written uh, because they follow a different process through the bank. Um, so, so actually, it, it, and, and who is picking up on that account at what point to identify those debits to the account that, that build the pattern that say to you, wait a minute, there's something not right here. Um, that's what I mean by having in place a process to identify uh, the risk of financial harm. Um, does your bank have an understanding? Uh, ha does your bank understand the reporting mechanisms to get help for vulnerable customers? Now, I'm conscious that that will differ between Scotland and England, uh, and England and Wales rather, um, because because the the two the two halves of the UK operate under different legislation. We've got the Care Act of 2014. I think it is down south. Uh, where up north there is the Adult Support and Protection Scotland Act of 2007 and also the, the, the Adults with Incapacity Act of 2000 in, Scot in Scotland. So two legal jurisdictions, two clear different, clearly different processes. Whatever those processes are, um, do your branches, do your, does your bank know 
uh, how to get help for vulnerable customers. And you know, we've got experience of um, one particular bank uh, a number of months ago. I got a phone call to say a woman had marched into the branch with her debit card, a zero balance. Sorry, she didn't have the, the, the debit card, zero balance in the account, uh, no food in the house, um, down on her uppers, and. Um, when the bank staff checked her account, there was expenditure in Asda and Sainsbury's and, and places like that. And she said to the uh, the branch manager, well, actually, I gave my card to my friend. Um, so the bank managed to get the friend in. And, of course, as soon as um, the friend realised that the bank was on to me, he, he threw the card in the ground and, and legged it out the door. So the branch were left, the bank branch was left with this destitute customer. Now, the temptation might have been to phone the police, but the police would have turned up and said, listen, there's nothing in this, there is no crime. She gave the card to this guy. Um, where what actually happened uh, at the end of the day was, with a little bit of uh, pushing and shoving, uh, a social worker turned up at the branch to take the lady away and, and, and get her the help she needed. But in that circumstance, the reason I say that is, that was a welfare issue. It wasn't necessarily a criminal. I mean, the criminal issue would probably have arisen later on. But at that point in time for the branch, and, you know, hats off to the branch for actually doing what they did. They weren't letting that lady leave the branch without getting some help for her. Um, but these are the kind of situations where I'm not sure that we would, that, that, that banks, would, you know, across the country and every nook and cranny of the UK would understand how to get help for vulnerable customers. Um, and would your bank engage in innovative product development to ensure that vulnerable customers are offered appropriate financial services? Because you know we've got the we've got the occasional paper, we've got the vulnerable vulnerable customers papers by the FCA, we've got the BBA paper, um, we've got various other resources uh, flying around. But I haven't seen an awful lot of evidence that financial services products are actually changing. And, and that would be an interesting uh, view to get from you as well. So, the pledge is came out of the project that we, and I'm conscious of the fact that the BBA had, you know, they listed those principles in, in their document. But from a Scottish Government project point of view, what we uh, are trying to push just now is a pledge, a common pledge, whether you're a social worker, whether you're a doctor, whether you're a lawyer, whether you're a banker, that everybody that is a stakeholder should be signing up to this pledge and, and we've put a proposal into the Scottish Government uh, who are considering uh, how to get this done uh, at the moment. So, so, But that's the wording of the pledge that we agreed. So, and, and you know, there's nothing controversial in there. It's committed to working collaboratively, participating in raising public awareness, raising awareness internally, um, having in place a process um, to identify and, and financial harm and, and report it. Can I just take you back then to the questions that I asked you before? These six questions are exactly what's in the pledge. That's why I asked you that, those questions. And, and if you thought that you were able to answer most of them yes, I suspect your organisation would not have a great deal of problem um, in signing up to that pledge. And And... Frankly, the signing of the pledge, the wording, means less to me than the public uh, image that this presents, because actually what it presents is a real awareness out there that banks are committed to working with public sector agencies to protect their own customers, and there's ample evidence of that. I could, I could, I could sit from here to doomsday and tell you about some of the things that banks have been doing over the last three years, but do you know what? It's really not getting an awful lot of airtime, and I think it's high time that we started promoting what the banks are doing and are prepared to do publicly, um, and 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 stop hiding our light under a bushel. Uh, because I think uh, hiding our light under a bush. Because I think we really need to start um, sh shouting from the rooftops about what what the banks are involved in, because it is a very very good news story. Frankly, um, it's not perfect. Absolutely not perfect, but boy, is it, is it a good news story. A couple of 
Sorry, yeah. Um, so th this is just th this slide just gives you, a, and I'm not going through this in any detail at all. It gives you some awareness of what's been going on over the last three years. Huge amount of activity, uh, both in Scotland and across the UK. Um, and lest, and lest anybody be in any doubt, I've personally been to the FCA, to the PRA, to the BBA and briefed them on what's happening in Scotland um, and have, have yet to hear a, a dissenting voice. Um, one of the things we have in Scotland just now is a group of, of banks that just sit together and talk about local, uh, sorry, not local, common um, issues that they have. Uh, and one of, the, one of the issues they had was the way that the public authorities are seeking to get financial information from banks about people who may be harmed. Um, so I said, we, you know, went back to the banks and said, listen, why don't we proactively make up a document and present it back to the local authorities uh, as being a single process for Scotland, uh, which has been done. It was signed off by Social Work Scotland a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we're just waiting on the Adult Protection Committee chairs to sign it off, and then it will become a single process. Now, that's something that I tell you I'm going to be shouting about because that's an action that the banks took to improve the situation in Scotland. Um, it wasn't social workers, it wasn't any public sector agencies, it wasn't me. It was banks that took that action to actually improve things in Scotland and it will streamline and, and speed up the process for, for getting information. That's the kind of things that, that, that can happen with collaboration. A couple of very quick case studies. Um, and things are getting better. And I'll just read these, these case studies out to you, and you can tell me at the end if, you know, if you've got any comments on it. Mr. Pelosi, an 87-year-old gentleman from Glasgow, had been in, poorly, uh, in poor health and was in hospital. His 40-year-old son had continuing power of attorney, and I think in England they've got a different, you've got a different uh, name. It's power of attorney, but it's, it's the power of attorney over... Um, finances and welfare. In Scotland it's called continuing power of attorney, but I can't remember the term it's, it's given uh, down south. Um, bank staff were aware of both the power of attorney and the fact that Mr Pelosi was in hospital because the bank staff knew uh, Mr Pelosi. They had a, a relationship with him uh, which caused them to know that he was in hospital. It became evident to bank staff while Mr Pelosi was in hospital that money was being transferred from his, Mr. Pelosi's account into his son's two business accounts in apparent contravention of the terms of the power of attorney. Uh, having identified that, the bank made contact, direct contact with the public guardian who carried out a swift investigation and stopped any further cash from being withdrawn. Now, the actions of the bank and the relationship between the bank and the public guardian proved key to early intervention and protection of the elderly customer's money. There was subsequently a police investigation which was instigated after a report was submitted by the public guardian, so it wasn't even the bank who instigated the, the inquiry. I would suggest there are three comments to be made from that. One was the willingness of the bank to act when something didn't appear right. Secondly, I think it was the knowledge of the bank about where to place their report. If the original circumstances had been reported to the police at that stage, it's likely it wouldn't have been accepted as a crime. And thirdly, there was absolute evidence that the bank and its staff had their customer at the heart of everything they did. Tangible evidence, I would suggest. And these are real, these are real life situations that we've debranded. Uh, secondly, Mrs. Anderson, an 85-year-old lady from Dundee, requested that her bank increase her overdraft. Mrs. Anderson said she would repay the money as soon as she received her dividend from a French company that she had recently invested in. Now the bank staff again with local knowledge were aware that Mrs Anderson had been the victim of an online lottery scam a number of years previously. So they made contact with the local trading standards officer who carried out a quick check and found that the French company was in fact an organised crime scam. The customer didn't get her overdraft and investigations were commenced to find out the source of the scam. The local authority became involved via trading standards and took steps to make sure that Mrs Anderson had support mechanisms in place, mainly by her own family and, and, and support from some social workers. I would suggest to you three comments from that one as well, that bank staff were aware of the customer's previous history and were alert to unusual activity or requests. 
Secondly, the bank had very strong connections with their local trading standard service and were able to contact them directly for information which informed their judgment about what to do next. It put them in a strong position to make a call on Mrs Anderson's welfare. And thirdly, Mrs Anderson got the help she needed simply because a bank was prepared to act to support their customer. They did the right thing rather than looking for a process to follow. Now I would suggest to you these two case studies represent two members of communities, one in Glasgow and one in Dundee, who are safer now um, than they were before simply because of the actions of a bank. Not because of the actions of police or anybody else, but because of the bank, uh, or the banks, plural, um, you know, understanding the customer, understanding that they had to make a decision, and, and getting information from the right sources that enabled them to make that decision. And that was all through local collaboration. So what are the benefits in all of this? What are the benefits in getting engaged with this whole financial um, harm agenda? Well, I would suggest to you that it's enhanced customer service proposition for every bank, building society, credit union. I think it's a cost-effective cost proactivity because the cost of prevention is minuscule um, when you compare the cost of the cure, when you, you think about um, the impact of financial harm on people, um, the, the treatment they've got to get, and, and so on and so forth, and, and some people end up in care homes. It prolongs people's lives in their own home. Um, it reduces pressure on, on a, a, a very, very under-pressure care home system. Uh, it reduces residential care costs. Um, and, you know, it makes it a less fertile territory for organised criminals. And it actually go, it, it contributes to uh, the well-being of communities. And, you know, UK government, Scottish government are very, very keen on, on all of that stuff. So it's, it, it, it fits with the political agenda in Scotland and the, the UK as well. So in summary, I think we can demonstrate overt support of financial services for protecting customers. I think collaboration between financial services organisation and public sector organisations is key to this. The Police uh, Office of the Public Guardian Social Services Training Standards. I think collaboration between pension companies and banks because there is a disconnect between pension companies and banks. Pension companies will tell you, well, we don't actually give the money out. We usually credit the money to somebody's account uh, in a bank. Uh, and I think there needs to be greater uh, cohesion between the pension companies and the banks to talk about the vulnerability of the individual into whose account the, the money is going. Um, I think there needs to be ongoing frontline training and support for frontline staff. Um, and joint training with partner agencies, I think, is key to the whole thing. And, and overall, cohesion of public and private sector uh, services uh, to enhance community safety. So I think, you know, there are issues to ponder. I'll, I'll leave that with you, you know. Um, what is the bank focus? Um, you know, are the banks talking to Financial Conduct Authority, Age Scotland, or, or Age UK, Alzheimer's Scotland, or you know whoever it happens to be about financial product devolution, um, integration of public services? How, how does the bank engage at a local level when public services are being integrated? Um, there is an increased uh, availability of disposable funds. I spoke earlier on about the desire for rapid transactions and customer care versus the need for a slower process to enable due diligence. Um, that collective capacity and recognition of roles, so understanding each other's roles is key to it. Um, empowering local managers to engage locally and collaborate locally with external partners, I think, is key from a financial services point of view. Uh, and I think the whole thing, if we actually talk about it and we we somehow pull this and coordinate it, uh, will enhance the reputation of financial services in the UK. My message, I think, locally is if there's three pals you want to make, it's social services, police and trading standards, because between the three of them and the, and the local bank, there ain't a problem they can't solve, uh, quite frankly. And I'll leave you with a last, lasting comment. Um, 
if we all stay silent, um, evil will succeed. But I think if we all collaborate and we all get together and work together, uh, I think that we will succeed very rapidly in squeezing out organised crime in terms of targeting people for financial harm. Thank you, folks. Thank you, Graham. That was a really informative presentation. I've just got a couple of questions that I think we've got time to get through. Yeah. Um, so the first one is, as the population in general becomes more transit, moves around geographically and potentially relocates, retires to another part of the country or abroad, then how do banking relationships that started off locally have to adjust to reflect the global perspective? Yep. For example, an elderly relative relocating from the West Midlands to Devon to be nearer to family, how does the bank update its relationship with that customer when they might not transfer their account from one branch to another? Yep. Um, so, so, so that, I, I think, you know, it's a really, really good point. Uh, the, the, the transient population is a really, um, it, 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 it needs to be worked on. Um, I, I think, it, you know, go back to what I said earlier on about knowing the customer and understanding the customer. Um, and, and, you know, it probably hits on the internet transactions and, and having processes in place to identify unusual transactions. Um, so whether the customer is on your doorstep or whether the customer is 200 or 300 miles away, um, it's about banking processes. It's about understanding that the customer has moved away to be closer to relatives um, and, and, and actually talking to customers and understanding the the the, the, um, the the, the regular process, or the, 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 what's the word I'm looking for, the, 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 the normal, uh, the normal transactions, um, so that we can identify uh, unusual ones. But I think, to, to be honest with you, it's about knowing customers and knowing when they're moving about and where they're moving about as much as we possibly can. I am, I'm not saying for one minute that banks are the be-all and end-all. I said that at the very beginning. I'll say it at the end. I don't think you're going to solve the problem. You know, nobody's going to hold banks up as being uh, the solvers of the problem, uh, but I think I think you can only do your best to understand who your customers are, where they are, and what their normal patterns are. Great, thank you, Graham. And then one final question is: Are you concerned that if a branch closure clo sorry if branch closures continue at the current rate, that the local branch staff who know their customers, as in the cases which you highlighted, will be lost? Uh, yes. Uh, in, in, in a word. Um, however, you know, I was in a local authority this morning who are beginning to teach people on um, the use of the internet and getting people more acquainted with how you do your banking online. I think there needs to be an awful lot more of that, and I think we've all got a responsibility uh, to teach people. And, and, and I guess the other mitigating part of that is that you know today's middle-aged population is tomorrow's older population, and they will be a bit more computer savvy. Um, so as, as branches close um, and people go online more, I think the elderly population will become more computer savvy. The problem with that, with the, you know, that aging population is that you know they might be computer savvy, but but they may suffer from, or they may be living with dementia or uh, Alzheimer's, or they may have physical disabilities. So so yes, I think I think there is a concern that while branches are closing, and, and there are reasons for branches closing, I'm not going into that, I'm, I'm not sure that, that we are collectively thinking about um, how we fill that gap. I think, you know, it's, it just seems to be an assumption that, well, we close a branch and they go online. I think it's, there's a bit more conversation to be had about how communities are supported, uh, not just by banks, but collaboratively by banks and other agencies. Thank you very much, Graham. Um, so, unfortunately, that's all we have time for today. Um, should anyone require a copy of the slides from today's presentation, you can download these from the Attachments tab. Um, I'd just like to ask one final favour of our audience. Please remember to give us a rating and feedback on today's session so we can continue to deliver the content that you would like to hear. So, thank you again to Graham. We really appreciate you taking the You're time welcome. to share your insights with us. And um, thank you to everyone for joining us today. Have a lovely day. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye.